All right, so thank you for hanging out. Of course. Really appreciate it. All right, so I want to know some history of Yancey and then get into how you use visuals in your worship sets. Yeah. Okay, so how did you how did you get into music? Where did that start for you? Yeah, so I remember, I mean... Rockstar dad. I mean, of making like kids puppet music. <laughs> I mean, he did. Yeah, I guess he was in bands in college and stuff. But uh, was he musical at all? Yeah, he plays guitar. And he, growing up, he was always, you okay. know, in bands through high school and college and all of that. Um, so music always kind of was a part to play. But I mean, as a career, he's just always been in church ministry, children's ministry, that that space. But he made music for kids specifically to do with puppets and also some worship music in the Did 80s. you run puppets? Did you do puppets? I did. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I did puppets back in the day. Of course. Let's not be ashamed. I'm not. Uh, hey. I'm not. As my dad says, puppets have been very good to our family. So <laughs> I have nothing but love. So did he, he was more in the still coaching and pastor role and not not super, mu I mean, music as it related to yeah, just a the hobby, puppet like stuff. A hobby and but it wasn't music. like following in his footsteps from a musical standpoint? No, no. Um, so, I mean, if I, if so, if I back up, I mean, first time I kind of like did something music wise, I was hanging out at church on a Saturday with my dad. There, we had this like kids worship team practice that happened. Someone didn't show up. I volunteered myself to like jump in and like, like the rest is history literally so from that point like i don't know started singing in the kids choir at church and just on worship teams for literally every age group i was in and singing you know special musics and offertories and all that kind of stuff and like when i reflect back on it like music i, I would say that i knew from the time i was single digits like god had put me on this earth to do music mm -hmm. it's not like i ever had this specific like you know, thus saith the Lord, my you yeah. know, some light like shone down at camp or whatever. Yeah. It's just like, on as, far back, as, I can, yeah, as far back it. as I can remember, it's like, my name is Yancey and like, like music is why I'm here, like what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So I definitely set out on a path like of, you know, wanting to become an artist and all that kind of stuff. And like, mm -hmm. cool story, my youth pastor, uh, when I was 14, I guess, like God put it in his heart and was just like, you know what Yancey wants to do? How can you help her take a next step? Mm -hmm. And so we planned, this was like several months in advance, planned this one Wednesday night. So August 16th, 1995, I was 15, did my first concert. And that really like started a snowball then of me like starting to pull some songs out that I'd written and like make my first little two song demo and, you know, go to some conferences about Christian music that the Gospel Music Association put on and stuff, becoming an artist and just started coming to Nashville and recording and like did that whole thing and wrote for a lot of years, really kind of focused yeah. on like a normal CCM style music. How fast stuff. did that happen for you? Did you starving <clears throat> artist for a period or did it happen well, really I mean, quickly going right in in Nashville? Uh, uh, I, I definitely made some connections through that conference that I had attended and it was for like independent artists and writers. Um, you know, like I was a teenager and a young adult. So like I lived at home, but also the church that we were a part of did a lot of ministry conferences and stuff. And just with connections of my dad being a ministry and, you know, even like initially calling up his friends and whatever, like I, I would say I got to start traveling and touring and doing ministry and like, being paid you know Faster paid to do it and it's always been yeah that's always mm -hmm. been my job just of connecting and being able to get certain gigs at churches and have opportunities to go out and do stuff it's not like i was just having a cold call right right you know some church down the street right but so you wrote for um ccm artists that yeah that i mean and that it really was like all rooted in me being an artist and doing co-writes and meeting with labels and A&R people, you know, at the back in the day, like I was trying to get me signed. Right. That was, that was the goal. Um, and had a lot of things like almost happen. Mm. Deals almost happen. I won 
this competition that the Gospel Music Association did called the Spotlight Competition is what Jars of Clay had won back in the day. So it was kind of a big deal at the time where like, normally it was kind of like a shoe win if, you know, that person wins the competition, like they're gonna get a deal. And I actually had been like in serious talks with the label at the time, but they were going through a president change. And so the old president was like, wait and do the deal mm -hmm. once the new guy comes. So, and so I, won the com I won the competition oh. and then the new president said no. Mm which i mean it's a very long long story but it's also fun like literally like earlier this year i got to like stand face to face with that man and say thank you because i know now like him saying no was obedience to god because if i had signed that deal i would have never Took arrived path, doing what i do so what was the path that you ended up taking so I, um, so I, I did the Nashville thing for a lot of years. I also started leading worship for my church back home in Oklahoma at the time. And it was like a one day a week thing. So I was like, still do your music stuff and just show up and lead the student ministry and worship, but uh, you know, it was a paid contract thing. Yeah. And around that same time I had started writing the theme song for a summer camp program that our church did and and that was just kind of like who do we know that can write a song oh well yancy's been in nashville like writing songs so we'll have her do it yeah and i did that for about five years in this like season got to a certain point where it was like oh you know what i could take those five songs and i could grab a couple that i recorded for my friends that now are orange um as it's known now i could get masteries from that and record you know like four more songs and make a kids record still not having like a grand vision for like what that meant or could be it was just more so like i know tons of kids ministry people like let's yeah. do it so um so i did that and then around the same time also was like taking on more and more different age groups of worship at our church um, that I was working full time at, at this particular little point in life and went through kind of a transition that next year, even made the first little praise party album okay. on staff at the church. Okay. So I didn't make that for me. I made it for them and for what we needed in our local, you know, like preschool ministry. And, um, was it called that then? It was called Little Praise Party, okay. My Best Friend. Yeah, okay. it was a different artwork, but same master, and that's what it was called. Okay. So we made that and then went through a huge transition that year. And I went back to doing music full time and honestly um, knew that although I'd been like leading worship for adults and overseeing student worship and had my hands in our preteen worship and that preschool project was like the last thing I'd taken on. Yeah. And so as I was transitioning back, it was just like, well, what like what is this going to look like like i can't tell the world i'm doing all of this <laughs> yeah so just started walking stuff out and god opening doors and i did one tour with a uh, organization called christ in youth that was for middle schoolers and they also that year had me do a tour with preteens okay an event called superstart and it was just yeah. very easy to see that I was connecting with those preteens. There was just more fruit. I was selling more CDs, like all the things. And where it, did the Avalon song <laughs> come in? <laughs> See, it's so layered and come good. Okay, that's that's before. So okay. that's about five, six years. What before. was the What was the song? I don't want to go. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to go for Avalon, and that was literally just like. A writer that I had been writing with several times for me, we, I would come to town for like a week at a time and just have a bunch of co-writes. Okay. Had a co-write with that particular guy and we worked really well together. And he already had another cut on that Avalon record and knew like they're picking the final songs for this project. And we both kind of talked about where we were in life and I was... Uh, for the first time in my 20 years <laughs> of living at that point, like didn't really have some dates on the calendar looking ahead. And although I lived at home and, you know, didn't have true bills, you know, I was like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. and so that was kind of like my mental state. My co-writer at the time was trying to decide if he was moving to LA to write pop music. 
And so we both were kind of in this like transition season and just kind of like, what, what's next and what do you have for me, God? And we wrote, I don't want to go, which is literally about all of those things. Mm -hmm. And it was literally like, the same day we wrote it, they were like, okay, come back in tomorrow. We'll do a p piano vocal demo. I think we had a hold on the song, which is kind of like a contract on a house, right. so to speak, um, to, to, to hold the song for Avalon. I think like within the, a day or 48 hours. So it was a very fast process mm -hmm. and like new, I think within like another month or two, like it was a definite deal. And then the album came out really about nine-ish months later, I think. And then my song was the last single from that record. So it was like, I think, single five or so. What was and the name of the album? Oxygen. Avalon right. Oxygen. That's right. So I Don't Want to Go. It was number one for five weeks. And fun, fun CCM trivia. Okay. So I only noticed this like in a year or so ago, glanced up at this thing hanging on my wall and realized I can only imagine was like number two. So I think like it must Did have been- Did you dethrone? I can only imagine. I think so. Ah! Like I think, I think it was like, like that. So, but I don't remember it being like that era yeah. of time. So it caught yeah. me off guard when I glanced up and yeah. saw, I was like, wow. oh, that's kind of fun. But yeah, number one, five weeks yeah. was on the Wild Hits record that year, has made it on two greatest hits records. So that song did absolutely everything a song can do in Christian yeah. music. Okay, so that kind of moved <laughs> you like, into- <laughs> Long Crazy. answers. Yeah, no. Uh, so that kind of, I mean, the last, what, 20 years you've been touring and doing. Yeah, so 25 years. I'm about to complete year 25. Nice. Yeah. So did it move from like older into a younger age group? Or yeah. did so you kind of lock in to. It was really by the start. So in that transition where I was doing the super start preteen thing in middle school, by the start of 08, I knew God was shining a light on families and preteens. I was just having people call me even like before I was saying that's what I did. I was having some churches randomly call and ask me to do that. And it was just with what was happening on the road with Superstar, it was easy to see there was fruit being born in that area and God yeah. was blessing it. And so I kind of, I will say, you know, I grew up around children's ministry. That's what my dad did. So very familiar with it. I can tell you never once was there a family conversation where it was like, Hey, Nancy, why don't you take that music thing that you're into and mix that with the children's ministry thing? Like literally that was n never an idea. Um, and you know, I have to say like in, in sincerity, I don't think if God had revealed that vision and plan to me as a 16 year old, when my eyes were just set on, you know, being yep. on the cover of CCM magazine and yep. you know, like, hanging with Amy Grant or whatever. Right. Um, I, I don't know that I would have had the mental space to give him my yes, you know, at that point. With where I was in that season and like already been like, like I say, God gave me some easy yeses where it's just like, write this song, do this one little event. But mm -hmm. I dipped my toe in the water enough to see like, hey, this works. Right. You know, like, and this is cool. So by the start of 08, it was just kind of like, okay, like this is what he has. And then I think just slowly year by year, uh, it's more and more awareness of how cool is God and how kind is God that he took all these pieces of my life and literally like put them in a blender, you know, so to speak, yep. to be like, right, this is my offering. Okay, so let's get into the content in your worship sets. Yeah. Okay. I really want to dive into the video content and the mm -hmm. visuals you use in your worship. Yeah. Okay. So for a long time, you've been using uh, lyric videos, mm -hmm. both in an animated form. Yeah. Uh, and then more motion graphics, motion graphics, lyric video types. Isn't stuff. that what the people call it? That's it. That's it. That's <laughs> okay. the lingo. The MoGraph. Yeah. Is oh, what the, yeah. I, know, I, know, I, don't I don't like that. All right. So when did you start using video content in your sets? Oh my gosh. Um, I, well, I would say if I back up a long ways, I mean, I grew up around it. I, it was in the nineties that our church started making such a thing. Did that make a, a difference for you? Like, oh, this is, this is reaching me, this visual, did it make a difference for you at all? Man, to have I, think more? It, I think it's just like, 
I think it, for one, it su was super practical. So, I mean, if you're coming in off of what had been overhead projectors or yeah. tree, 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 I mean, slides, tree, tree, like all of that technology, yep. to have it be this all-in-one bundle where your track and your words yep. are tied together, timed together, and happen to be something colorful and fun, like what's not to love, you yeah. know, about it. So I would say I started experiencing that um, just in how ministry was being done as far back as the 90s, really. And so from the get go um, and what I started doing for kids and making that transition, it was just as an automatic thing of like, OK, well, if I'm going to write these songs, I want to make it where churches can sing these songs. So I'm going to make a lyric video even before like the rest of mainstream music yep. world started doing such a thing because it's a great way to actually engage participation, invite people to sing. And it's, you know, it's one click of a switch yep. for a whole song and not someone manually sitting around, you know, so timing things or bouncing back and forth. Is it true for you life. that your audience watches music as well as listen to music? Yeah, you know I, mean? I definitely think so. I mean, and I will say for me um, and what I do live, you know, like if I'm coming in and I'm doing a concert or I'm leading worship somewhere, obviously it says in there, like, I need video projection, you know, and once in a while, blue moon, I am with a situation where it's like, whether it's an outdoor event or whatever, someone starts yeah. hee hawing. I'm like, well, we can't do that, you know. And I'm like, you if stipulate. I, if I don't, I've have you, I, I need it, and or like, don't hold it against me later. <laughs> if I'm just singing to this crowd and they're not engaged with me and they're not participating, if I don't, okay. because I don't have this. So let's get resource. to that. Why do the visuals matter? Why yeah. is it such a big deal in the contract that you're like, don't hold it against yeah. me if they're not. Why is that visual component so yeah. compelling? Well, I mean, I think the biggest factors is like, I need the words, you know, that, I mean, that's that's a biggie. But then I think it's just also there's just something that I mean, especially in our culture today, like people are just nonstop used to seeing video and yep. things and they need they need that action to like stimulate their brain and trigger like stay in this and do this. So, yeah. I, I mean, a, a big part of it is the words because I can't ask people to sing along with something that they don't know and aren't familiar with and aren't really aware of what the words are. Mm -hmm. But I mean, those two things married together just only makes for a stronger presentation that has the potential to engage the most people. And in your sets, do you do, do all all the the entire set does it have a video to every single song why yeah. why have you chosen to do that yeah i with the exception of sometimes i will sit down and play just the piano that's like a little ballad moment or whatever that's the only thing i do that yeah. doesn't have a video but everything else when i'm like full on trying to per get people to participate with me and be a part of what i'm doing there's video and there's lyrics mm. um for that so you do some for younger age kids that are more car cartoon based yeah. and motion graphics. Why do you why do you do both? I mean, ultimately to engage the most people. So, you know, I write some intentional songs for younger age kids that are just very concrete, very repetitive, very action oriented lyrics um, and just you know, years ago, we had that first little praise party record. And when I got ownership of it, um, you know, it was automatic of like, okay, I'm going to make videos for this. So right. churches can do it. And, um, you know, just started working with a company that did more animated type mm -hmm. stuff. And I'm trying to think back because it's not, it's not like there was a specific thing of like, yeah. oh, let's be like some various kids and you know, it just kind of like yep. grew. It started with cartoon Yancey, just some various assets were made and, yeah. it, and, and it kind of grew. And like, even I will tell a little story there. So one day the animators, they messaged me and they said, we're thinking of you having a pet. Do you want a dog or cat? And I said, neither. Cause I really am not a big animal person, but I do like pigs. You said a pig. Yeah. And so I was like, neither. I said, I like pigs. And they were like, I love it. It's quirky. It's yeah. fun. It's different. So and so there's pig. a pig that 
plays drums and guitar and keyboard. And sometimes yeah. you have, you'll do an animated version and then a lyric version of the same song. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I will do that because, um, you know, the stuff that I make that's geared more preteen, elementary, adult, like whatever yeah. that is, like that's always going to be a, a MoGraph. Was that the lingo? The MoGraph, MoGraph is the lingo. Yes. I got to start using that in a sentence. Yeah. Um, what happens is sometimes I've had a few songs that I originally wrote for my little praise party series, which is the cartoon one, and then get into doing it live, start working in like some family concert environments and realize like, Hey, I've got older kids that are engaging with this song. And I start realizing that the song itself could work with a broader age group, you know, even a, an older, you know, like preteen demographic in my case. But then it's like, oh, the video, you know, right. like I don't want right. to show up to a preteen only right. camp that I'm leading worship for and play them cartoon yeah. Yancey. Yeah. I'm too cool for school. That's not going to Exactly. Me. That's yeah. like not how I win over, you know, brownie yeah. points with right. a fifth grade boy or whatever. So in those cases, then I go back and, um, Sometimes make some audio mix changes as yeah. well to the track. Sometimes it's an opportunity to be like, hey, I've got an idea and like, let's yeah. explore this a little differently. Sometimes it's pretty similar. Like in the case of Super Wonderful, the track's actually the same. And the original version and then the comic book version, which yeah. is one of the first things we did together. Yeah. Um, and so then I just go back and it's like, hey, let's, let's repackage this. And I look yeah. at, I look at, Things like the videos or even going back and I know how it did a super wonderful remix like yep. this year. I look at all of that visually and sonically as it's like a different outfit, you know, like yep. it's it's a different gift wrap package, you know, that you're giving. It's a different style of clothes that you're putting on it, where in that case, as a worship leader perspective, I can keep doing this song super wonderful that they know, love, appreciate all that stuff. And then I can, you know, for instance, like over the summer leading camps, day three of camp, come out and do the remix. Right. It's something very different, feels yeah. different, looks different, all the things, but yet it still is a familiar melody and lyric. So my participation is sky high through the roof, yeah. but I'm just changing what I'm presenting. So let's dive into that some because we've worked together on several lyric videos mm -hmm. for you and countdowns and different things. So yeah. probably let's get into the weeds of how we've worked. Let's take Super Wonderful maybe. Okay. So I think with that one, if I remember right, I want to say like the pictures were too young or something at first and we aged it up. Well, how, how did I we mean, come to, okay. to, to things like that together? And I think, you know, everyone has like things that just, they're into or not into or whatever. For me, I don't love photos in my videos. Yeah. Like some people, some people are into that. They like the human visual layer or whatever. Yeah. It's just not my preference. I feel like for me, if I put humans in a video, it's all going to age faster than the things right. that don't. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a personal preference. So I think yeah. first, first round maybe came with like, footage of yeah. kids or something doing something <clears throat> and then i was just like e, can we yeah. please not yeah yeah well i think people would be interested in that kind of that process because yeah. it's not like it, it is a digging in the dirt together and figuring it out creatively um okay so why do you obviously with both the cartoon version and the lyric videos you're spending a good chunk of change to do all of that. Why is that worth it to you to have high quality? Yeah. Why, why is it worth it? Well, I mean, for me, and I think if I back up, because I, I, I can say this, honestly, <laughs> I'm not like poking a finger. It's just true. Like not all kids music out there is created equal right. and it's production value. Right. Um, I, I definitely know that I offer one of the highest quality mm -hmm. audio experiences in yep. my production uh, uh, that's out there. And I think some of some of that, I mean, it's multi-layered for one, a big reason to even I think my approach of how I make kids music and writing songs is 
I set out to make music in life and to be an artist and to be a songwriter. And I want to do that at the top of my game. And I feel like I've learned and I put it in the hours to do that. And so the fact that I'm making it for kids doesn't cut any corners to me. Right. It doesn't make me lower my bar and go, well, that's good enough because it's just a song for camp or it's just a, this song for VBS or whatever. Yep. I think, again, not trying to poke a finger and judge, but I think there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen where it's just a hobby or it's just kind of this thing that someone does and they they haven't learned all the rules to break the rules. I mean, that's a, that's a rule of songwriting. And... And so at the end of the day, I'm still trying to make great music that still has great melodies, has yep. catchy hooks, like all the things. And I happen to be doing that for kids. Right. Rather than, oh, it's for kids, so it's okay to be like third rate. Yep. And I think we, f we feel the same on the video side that like, especially when we get such great music. Yeah. To rise, to rise yeah. to it from a video level. Yeah. And I think those two things working together, yeah. I think people notice. Yeah. I think really people notice the quality. Yeah. Um, it does take more production. It takes more yeah. money. It takes more effort to, to do that. Yeah. Do you think it's worth it? I think it's worth it. I, I mean, it's one of those things. It's like, I hope people appreciate it. You know, yeah. I, I did have a lady not too long ago and she was like, thank you, you know, like, Thanks so much for you, dude. Like, no one else does it exactly like you or whatever. And I was like, well, I know that, but I'm glad you, you know, yeah. like, I'm glad you know that. And I yeah. wish, yeah. I wish it felt like more people connected those dots and understood yeah. what was being presented to them. But I think for me as well, visually, if so, if I back up, because a big part of my ministry really has been preteens. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people only know me for a little praise party, cartoon Nancy. Sometimes people from Superstar World, for instance, they only knew me on the preteen side and didn't realize I had this other thing going over here. But especially with preteens, I feel like I've, I've always been able to connect with them and really invite them in and lead them somewhere, building rapport, trust, relationship, engagement with what most people would be like, that's the hardest group of the hardest age group for yeah. us to connect with. You know, like that's the, those are the kids that are rolling their eyes and crossing their arms and deciding they don't like what we're doing on Sunday morning in kids church or whatever. Um, I think a big part of how I've always been able to win in that area is that I'm not cheesy. Right. I'm not lame. I'm not hokey. Right. Honestly, I'm not silly. Like, mm -hmm. look up that word in the dictionary, and mm -hmm. then you will realize you don't want to yeah. be that. I think you do that. You have that rev reverence. You can have yeah. fun. Like, I, yeah, I'm serious, and I'm, I'm a fun person, but, but I'm, not a, I'm not a goofy, silly person. Right. Okay. So, click tracks. So, Go ahead. just backing up. So, I mean, because of that, all of that is layered. My visual presentation, and I mean, again, like, letting the cat out of the bag. Like, I'll tell people that do make videos for me. Like forget I do this for kids. Right. Like, you get flush that right. out of your brain. Go treat this how you would if it yes. was for a high school group yes. and, and life will be good. And I do think that that is true across the board that we found that if you age it up, I want to see if you agree with this. If you age it up, you get the youngers because the younger yeah. thinks they're, it's cool, but if you age it no down what. too much, then the older yeah. too, is too cool for school for the yeah. older. They're, like, the younger kids, they're along for the ride no matter what. Yeah. You know, like I've right. heard preschool kids singing along to, you know, a Cutlass rock song on the radio or whatever. Like that yeah. wasn't made for that age group, but they're going to latch onto whatever they right. enjoy and yeah. like at the time. And if yeah. there's enough other people in the room, they're going to they're gonna be a part of it. Like, yes, there's things you can do specifically for them, but I always am going to say aim high. Okay. So I was going to get into click tracks versus mm -hmm. instrumentals. When you're live, do you sing, does the video just play and yeah. you, you, do you play on top of the instrumental? Do you use click tracks? What's the, yeah. what's so the best way? Me and most of my live settings, I'm just going to be using a stereo track, like the same one that you hear. There's no click to it. It's just. So it's My instrumental. lead vocal re removed, uh -huh. so I still have the BGVs and all that kind of stuff on it. And You're playing um, guitar over it, though. Yeah. In some cases, I'm playing guitar. Sometimes I'm not, and I'm just singing 
dancing, you know, doing whatever. Okay. It depends on the song for me. Sometimes I'm just playing guitar over it. So, but most of the majority of the time I buy myself. So it's just me and live lyric videos and whatever instrument I might. Is that add to easiest that. for the operator at the church also? Like, just hit it. I mean, are you firing it from stage? Or I, mean, I have someone front of house that. Okay. Is it usually you bring your person or? I do. Because it doesn't matter how many. And, and the, like, this is a lesson too for like church tech people. And this is where you have to build a relationship right. with your tech person, whoever that is. Because yep. you can say, hey, okay, I want you to press play when this happens. Right. And you know, when you start that process, even at a church, like, yeah. it's like in one ear and out the other, you know? You have to go back and have the conversation. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about what I happened. I said, Jesus. Let's talk about what the failure, you know, like why that didn't work, why this way might've been better. Yeah. You build yeah. that relationship, you know, find out their favorite thing, bring them Frappuccinos if it's Frappuccinos, like, yeah you know, yeah. give gifts, like yeah. love offerings, all the things, but build a relationship with them to where they realize they can trust and can rely on when you say, okay, I'm going to share the scripture. And when I get to Just, heart, right. you know, yeah. roll that track. And this yeah. is where it's very important for you to, um, you're in control of your intros, instrumentals, you know, outros, all those things. I think sometimes people feel like using a track is a setback versus a live band experience. Yeah. And sure, there's, you know, there's advantages, disadvantages, there's a lot less flexibility, all of those things. But I can say like, you are still the leader and you can choose how, how to make those work for you Good. rather than against you, rather than being, you know, a deer in the headlights. Cause it's like, oh my gosh, there's 16 bars of music. And what do we do with it? You know, yeah. like pre-plan ahead of time, how to engage your audience or what you're going to share, you know, like how you can invite them into participation more. Um, and then, you know, plan out what those transitions look like. And so all of that to say, I have my person that comes with has worked with me a whole bunch and they know kind of, you know, what I'm going to say, what my talking yeah. parts are going to be. And so I think honestly, one of the greatest compliments to, um, my mom has traveled with me majority of the time for a lot of years, even still. And I got to do a Will Graham event, um, I guess like two years ago now. And so she was like in a TV truck, you know, like somewhere like totally n not even connected to my stage. And they were like, you've listened to the radio before because you know how on the yes. radio, like everything is like overlapping yes. and how she cued yep. my tracks, yep. you know, I'm not waiting and being like, roll right. that oh, track. So that you can talk over the yeah, intro. It's pre-planned yeah. where I'm going to talk and that track just naturally starts yeah. playing rather than me calling for it in most occasions. But I yeah. felt like that was a huge compliment. Right. It is. Okay. Do you, would you encourage kids churches or mm -hmm. kids pastors mm -hmm. to use more video to just use pro presenter lyrics why is it important that they would use more of your videos mm -hmm. or worship videos in general yeah i think so you know as someone who i make videos i sell videos i use videos like but even still like a video doesn't lead worship for you and so i'll give Good. that disclaimer it is a wonderful accessory. Yes. It is a wonderful tool. It's only going to enhance what I'm doing. Yep. Um, it never takes the place of that human factor saying, come everybody, clap your hands, shout to God with joyful songs, as David did in Psalm 47, 1, to lead and engage a crowd. Yeah. But it's only going to enhance it and take it from just like, you know, we've got papers here. Yeah. Or someone's projecting onto a wall you know, some static thing to invite people, hopefully in more so a heart posture of worship to participate. I feel that with video that, and with music too, I think music is an instrument, mm -hmm. a tool, video is a tool. It's yeah. an instrument that we can use to yeah. enhance the yeah. experience, to lead them to Jesus. Yeah. Because if it's not about salvation or spiritual growth, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to pack it up. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, I'll share, this is kind of like a weird thing to share, um, but I think it's just a good example. So, um, oh, my, my, okay, my mind's blank. Well, what, what's the famous Hitchcock movie? I've never the, seen you're it. You're talking about the birds or something like that? 
I uh, maybe I can't remember. I can't remember. Whatever oh, the most oh, famous uh, one though. Uh, but it was an interview with him, and he was. They were talking about some yeah, stuff. I mean, psycho. Psycho. Yes. Okay. 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 So it was an interview with him about Psycho again. Never seen it. <laughs> but, um, and he gave credit, not just, you know, this person's like approaching the interview and the success of it as his, you know, picture making and stuff too. But mixed with it, he gave credit to the composer of the soundtrack who had done like the, yeah. hee, 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 like whatever yeah. that thing is. And he basically was equating his visual with would music. have been lesser absolutely without that soundtrack and so You're the right. two pieces married together made yep. the ultimate best yep. experience yep. for that visual and that audio yep. experience all right so let's wrap it yeah i asked you this before I ask you is your last question here oh boy. why do visuals matter in kids worship Well, I'm, I mean, for me, the visuals are going to matter because my number one goal is to help lead kids into his presence. And so I'm using the video, the lyrics that are projected in that, whatever the creative packages that, you know, in some cases is eye candy, ear candy. In some ways, it's like, oh, that's kind of, you know, that's moving like I'm. I'm I'm going to shed a tear to that, you know, like yeah. I'm using all those things because I want kids to taste and see that he is good. So they will hunger and thirst for more of him. And I know that if I can lead them into this experience where they can just, you know, like have a taste. Like I, I had a young boy at our church I was serving not too long ago and he's a friend with one of my sons. And he told me afterwards, he was like, oh, I felt God's presence in worship today. And he had the biggest mm -hmm. smile on his face. And it was like, I knew for that boy who's now in like second grade, like he had experienced something that day that was going to mark him, maybe change how he came and approached Sunday morning, kids church, times of worship in the future yeah. because he had experienced God's presence. And so for me, that's the end goal. Like that's, that's the end game is helping kids fall in love with Jesus one song at a time. And so for me, I'm going to be able to increase my participation in that with my video visual presentation. Good. I so appreciate your friendship. Thank you for all you do. Yeah. I know that we, we didn't talk about your Dove Award, but I know that like, I, I know you enough to know that it's not about the awards and the prestige and the the, all, all of that. I wouldn't it, be making music new. for kids if it was about that. Right. It's it's about leading people to Jesus, and I appreciate that about you. And so, thank you for your faithfulness. And You're welcome. All thank that. you. You're awesome. Thanks for helping. <laughs> Make it happen. This has been a podcast presentation of Church Visuals, executive produced by Carl Barnhill, edited by AJ Schubert, title and show graphics by Angie Lomas. For more resources to help you visually communicate the gospel in your kids' ministry, visit Church Visuals dot com.